Sistema and Buteyko, two pretty well-known Russian breathing techniques. And I'm here with Matt Hill, who is going to be talking about Sistema. And I'm Patrick McKeown, who is going to be talking about Buteyko. And this is really, this is going to be a discussion to explore the similarities, the differences. So welcome, Matt. And uh, if you can just give a couple of words about yourself, and we'll take it from there. Hey Patrick, uh, thank you. Uh, a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, for the invite. And I think to it was uh, Jose, wasn't it, that kind of put us in touch by email. He'd kind of read mm -hmm. both books. So um, so yeah, and and I've been really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I've I've just got back off holiday and I had a class this morning, so uh, I've been kind of thinking through in my mind um, how it might go. But um, yeah, so my name's Matt Hill. Uh, I teach, I'm a professional Systema instructor. So I teach Systema in Wiltshire uh, in the UK. Um, for those that, uh, for the many of you probably that haven't heard of Systema or don't know what it is, it's uh, an ancient Russian martial art. Um, uh, we'll maybe pull more out of that as we go. Mm. But one of the key components of it is the breath work. And in fact, the first thing you start to learn uh, is breathing. You know, people think they come to a martial art and learn how to punch, kick, defend themselves. But actually, the, the first things you learn are, or relearn, uh, is how to breathe properly. And that's the kind of the fundamental function in Sistema. Um, and it's actually probably the fundamental function in, in life. Um, you know, all, almost all of our uh, physiological and psychological functions are underpinned by breathing. Uh, is the the core component to all of those and when you when you understand how to use that function better that you improve all of those other functions and your ability to understand what's going on in your body and and improve or enhance your health and your performance and sure, kind of sure. that's how Sistema works it, it begins with uh, health to, to restore normal function um, in the body both in your physical movements but in, in your breathing and your ability to manage stress uh, both physical stress and psychological stress, um, and then um, then then you kind of add the skill to that. So um, so it begins with health, um, and and then moves into application of that. Um, and and it, it's kind of it really system as a, a Russian martial art. But then on top of that, um, a lot of people break it out into two things. So people come and do that side, or many people are drawn by that side, and then when they realize the benefits of learning how to breathe properly and how much better it makes them feel and perform mm -hmm. um, and how much healthier they feel, then, you know, I also run just breathing and health classes too. So I kind of uh, split the two things out. Sure, um, sure. Even when we're teaching the self-defense side, it's, it's underpinned, uh, you know, by a lot of uh, breath work. So you're saying an ancient Russian technique. How ancient is it? Uh, what's the background to it? When was it first kind of developed uh, where did it originate from does it have a lot of eastern leanings for example yeah it, so a, a couple of questions in there i'll, I'll unpick mm. um it, so my my teachers are two gentlemen uh, two russian gentlemen one called mikhail ryabko who's the, the the kind of the modern founder of Sistema, and then uh, vladimir vasiliev who uh it lives in canada now but uh, was born and raised and, and served in the army in Russia. Um, they both got a military background and, and that's kind of how Michael learned it. So Sistema, um, according to, to, to those guys, is old. Uh, it, before it, Sistema is quite a modern name for it. Uh, before that, it was called uh, the Russian fighting system or Know Thyself uh, was, was, uh, was, was another name for it. And um, Mikhail learned it from his uncle, who was a bodyguard to Stalin. Um, but it, it, not so much did he learn breathing, but he, he learned mm, the, the, the combat side and how to better manage yourself. And through that, of course, you learn how to breathe properly. So, so, so the things he learned weren't just overt physical techniques of how to defend yourself, but how to make yourself um, less noticeable. Um, so for certain types of, you know, where well, the army in general doesn't like to be um, seen, you know, a soldier, the last thing he wants is to be noticed. He wants to kind of get in, get something done and get away. So 
Um, so both for, for the guys that did that kind of work and also, you know, the guys that, that there's a certain part of the Russian army called the Smirsh, which is the counterintelligence, the, the guys that will follow people through the streets and observe them, watch them, you know, all countries have them. And then I'm sure you know, pre-1990 though, Russia had a lot of them. Uh, I'm sure. And, and that date comes in as well. And so, um, and, and, and so to, to be able to do that, to covertly watch someone, um, even before you use the tricks and the skills and tradecraft, you need to be able to hide inside yourself. And breathing is the way that you calm yourself to such an extent that you don't have any flickers, twitches, yes. giveaways, uh, you know, yeah. any tension in your body. And so it, it's, it's a, a way to clean yourself of those giveaway tendencies, signals, you know, uh, unnoticed um, things. So, so, so he learned it from him and then he served, did a full service in the army, Mikhail. Um, and then when, the, uh, when the, the curtain came down in 1990, that kind of time, um, Mikhail was the guy, he was the go-to guy in the army at the time. He taught the, um, the, the counter-terrorism stuff, the, the, the kind of the, uh, wrote the manuals on that. And so in terms of um, hand-to-hand and close quarter work, Mikhail was the guy carrying that baby. And so when they were allowed to come out and start teaching these things, Mikhail started to teach it kind of in leisure centers and, and clubs and things around and people came to it. Vladimir was one of his top students and then he went away to Canada and started teaching it. And the, uh, the approach and the focus on breathing was such a difference that it kind of, a lot of people couldn't quite understand it, of course, and, and I'm sure you come across that. Uh, didn't see the relevance of it, but a lot of people really, uh, through experience of doing it, started to realize just how much a difference it makes to your performance, recovery, um, psychological state, just general physical sense and level of health and well-being, that they realized, you know, how much there was to it. So um, at that time, it was still called the, the, Rus the Russian martial arts or Russian fighting system. And uh, one day, Vladimir called Mikhail up from Canada and said, look, he said, it, you know, it's great, but we need another name for this. It's too big to be called just the fighting system or, you know, fighting Russian martial art. What should we call it? And Michael, they, they talked about it and they came up with the idea of the system because it's very much a, a complete holistic system underpinned by breath. So you've got breathing, movement, relaxation and posture are the four key principles that are focused on. And um, and, and that's how it came to be called Sistema. Uh, mm -hmm. Going back, it goes right back as far as the Russian fighting system goes. And the, it does have an Eastern influence, I think, because if you look at the size of Russia, it touches everything from the Far East to the Middle East, to Europe, to India, you know, to the, so, so many different cultures. Uh, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. of course, in the interactions, not, you know, not just trade and things, but fighting too, you know, they, they, they fought such a diverse, different type of people that they had to have something very flexible, but I'm sure they brought in some of the styles too. And, uh, and the breathing bit is interesting because the way Michael tells it, the, the, the warriors, first off, their, their job was to protect the rulers, but also the monasteries. And so when they would be protecting the monasteries, the, they, they do the job and then they come back and, you know, not just physically, but psychologically, you can be a little bit broken from that work, damaged, you know, traumatized. And um, so say the monks taught the warriors how to cleanse themselves of the, the trauma of that kind of work with breathing techniques and to be ready to, because what, what the army's in is that you can go out and do the job again tomorrow as a soldier, you know, they don't want you to do it once. So they taught them how to cleanse themselves uh, psychologically from the work using breathing techniques. And, um, and so that's how the breathing became so enmeshed. You know, I, I actually think it, it was probably more so. I think when you're living a much more active life and when you're much more embedded in nature, I think a lot of the breathing that we talk about would have been much more natural anyway. You know, you, you use the nose outside because you, you need to smell your environment. You need mm -hmm. to smell when things change. And so that comes in through the nose, you know. And um, is, it, is it in and out through the nose, is it, or is it in through the nose and out through the mouth? So, it, interesting, I, I had a, I taught a seminar in Ireland actually a while ago and there was a Batekio student that came on and 
so in the beginning, the, the breathing in system is very simple. In through the nose, out through the mouth, and continuous. So you don't, you try not to allow physical movements or outside influences to interrupt your breathing uh, unconsciously. And um, can I ask, is it quick or is it slow? Uh, so, so when it you're doing it... Hmm? needs to be adaptable. So if there's a high intensity of work, it'll be faster. Or if you're recovering from um, high stress or pain or injury or something, the breathing's quite quick. Uh, or if you're, re you know, uh, restoring. Um, but then relaxed is kind of longer or, or if you want to deeply relax longer still. Um, it, but, but most of the time it should be barely noticeable to you or, or, or to the outside. Um, and also, uh, it can be nose nose. So the optimum is nose nose. Um, so so the the in breath is the same regardless of whether you're up regulating or down regulating. It's really the out breath that seems to be changing. Yes. So if you're recovering from stress, then you're taking the breath in through the nose, but you're having a prolonged and relaxed exhalation or a slower exhalation out through the mouth. And if you want to up regulate, say that again. Or a burst exhalation. So a burst okay. exhalation, is that for to upregulate, to stress the body and to recover? It can be. No, it can be. It can be. So if you need to get yourself prepared, um, ready, ready, prepared or ready to fight in an instant or, or for something, mm -hmm. you, can, you can do that. Or if you need to downregulate from a high level of shock or stress. To release it, trauma. To release trauma, yeah. Um, yeah. Very good, very good. Because we know, we know from the breath itself that the speed of the exhalation can influence the, the parasympathetic response. And it's when we have a slow and prolonged exhalation that we can have to downregulate. And if we have a very quick exhalation, um, it can have to upregulate. So it's yeah. interesting that there's ties there that are coming across from your work and from my work as well. And we yeah. would expect some similarities as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the kind of, and I think there's lots, you know, um, even, even the nose, nose bit is, mm. you know, like I say, the optimum is nose, nose, but then, but if there's stress that you need to eject, then, um, kind of nose mouth. Um, and even the, the faster breathing, um, when you want to downregulate, you just go to a, a high speed, uh, in order to meet where you are and then bring it down to, to kind of match. Can I ask Matt, the volume here I would be intrigued in. So mm. when, for example, um, you're breathing faster, are you breathing harder? For example, do people feel lightheaded as a result of doing it? In other words, is the technique, even though it's increasing the respiratory rate, what effect is it having on minute ventilation? Is it causing people to overbreed or is it keeping minute volume pretty much on an evil keel? So, it, so it, it needs to be, um, you, you shouldn't be over breathing. So, so you need to be able to regulate where you are. So it's not like an automatic, it's, it, it doesn't have to be robotic. It can be. So you're just, you're really feeling down through your body as you go and you're applying what's needed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a sufficiency to do the job. But, and if at any time you're feeling lightheaded, then you kind of increase the exhalation a little bit to bring it down. So you should be kind of a adjustable and adaptable. Um, so you're to... exchanging a lot of air in dead space, really. Um, mm. So it's an interesting one, for example, in comparison with the Wim Hof technique, which is a stressor as well. But mm. it can involve quite hard breathing and heavy breathing to cause hyperventilation. But for upregulation with systema, it's a stressor, or it can be a stressor. Um, but the the minute ventilation is 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 kept normal, which is interesting. Yeah, and 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 I think uh, for me very much systema is a, a feeling. There's there's a, a feeling in my body of of kind of how, what normal should be, you know, and uh, relaxed, calm, at ease. And uh, you know, if I, if my energy's running a bit low, I should be able to breathe in a way that can bring that up. And if my energy is feeling a bit high, I should be able to breathe in a way that brings that down. So it's kind of moment by moment self-regulation, really. So if your energy is low, then what do you recommend? So, um, so you can, so a couple of things. So you can do 
first breaths to kind of to, to, to wake yourself up, to bring yourself up. So that, that's something you can do if you're driving for, I mean, if you're driving and feeling tired, the best thing to do is to pull over. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you haven't got that option, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you're an operative and, and you've got to be following someone or doing something, you can, you know, burst breathe to, to bring yourself up. Um, do some light breath holds. Or if your kind of energy is quite low, um, kind of in, in your boots and you're able to, to move around, you can just do simple movements, but on a, on a breath hold. So you can kind of inhale a little bit, fill up, and then so have the oxygen inside you and do a few movements and that'll start to bring the energy up in the body. So you and take a breath in there. You just take a normal inhalation in through the nose. You hold the breath after the inhalation and then you do some movement with that. Do some squats. You can sit down in a chair, stand up a few times or mm. you know, do some, some push-ups and physical movements and that'll bring an energy back into the body and how long would you continue doing that breath hold for do you do it up until the point that you generate a light air hunger a medium air hunger or a strong air hunger uh so you can do it until you feel energized Mm -hmm. Uh, so you you can and and if that happens after one or some the better you get the less you need to do on that you know the more sensitive you get so just a a light air hunger uh, is enough and Um, then you resume breathing again Resume breathing. So I would typically, so inhale. And it's good to, if you, you don't need to fully inflate. So you can inhale fully, just don't let it a little bit so there's not too much pressure in the body. Mm-hmm. That can be dangerous too. And then, you know, I might do five, six, 10, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then I'll do a recovery breath just to kind of remove any, any fatigue, any tension from the body from, from doing the exercise, but keep the energy inside the body. Mm -hmm. And then if one was enough, that's fine. Or I might do um, a couple more. There's, there's also an exercise we do in Sistema where um, you get to understand yourself under stress using that technique. So you inhale, Exhale a little bit, and then you do on a breath hold one exercise. Maybe it's a push up or a squat or whatever. Then you recover. And then you check in yourself what effect just one movement on a breath hold had on you on your heart rate, blood pressure, um, it, level of fatigue, level of breathlessness, psychologically, what effect. And you see what you like at one. Then you fully restore, and then you do inhale, exhale hold your breath, do two of that exercise. Then you come back, restore and see what effect two had. So you know what level two is. Then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, you know, eventually you get to a stage where, you know, you're really starting to panic as you're doing the movements. Um, But you're you're understanding how to manage stress and panic, but also how to bring yourself all the way back down to fully restored. So you get quite elastic in the stressing your system and then consciously bringing it all the way back down to normal. And so if you kind of in a situation, maybe a, a bump in your car or something that straight away takes you to 11, you know that place and you, your body and your psyche knows how to restore yourself back to a, a very functional state from that state there. So. So, so this is really interesting. So with that exercise, then I th- if I gather this correctly, the level of stress is determined by the, the degree of air hunger. Yeah, and absolutely. you're starting off quite light at one and you're building it all the way up to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if it's yeah. a let, 10 or whatever. And you're exposing the body to the air hunger in order to decondition or desensitize the body's reaction to that stress or as a, as a means yeah. of dealing with stress. Yes. So you, you, yeah, I, I, I was going to question the, the decondition, but it, it, maybe it's okay. So there's a couple of things that you're trying to do. You're trying to do, understand that place better, make it not such a scary unknown mm. place. Mm. Um, and also you get your system, uh, you know, familiar with it. Um, and, and then it allow you to know that you can go there and come back, you mm. know, and know mm. how to come back. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. 
It's funny because I remember working with people with a lot of anxiety here as a result of the financial crash back in 2008. And I was given courses on Buteco mindfulness, hmm. you know, combining the two because I felt mindfulness is, is, very, is very useful. But I also felt that why not bring together Buteco because it involves functional breathing, it helps with sleep, etc. Yeah. And with some of the youngsters coming in, and a lot of them are typically female who would attend the, the breathing classes, I would have them expose them to air hunger, but it really put them into that fight or flight response. And this yeah. is 10 years ago, and I since have adopted it, and I've adopted it similar enough to what you described, but it's just by accident. So now when we have somebody coming in with a predisposition to panic disorder, because there's two subsets one subset of people with panic disorder, they react very strongly to the air hunger. Another subset, they're quite fine. It's uncomfortable, but they can cope with it. For people who react, if they have an overly exaggerated suffocation alarm, I give them a teaspoon of air hunger and I gently build them up. And yeah. that has been the best way that I've found because, and of course, I've just learned it from the mistakes that I made in the past. So I think that's phenomenal. Um, and you're using that for everybody, not just for people coming in with panic disorder. Yeah, everybody uh, does that. And, and, and you, you can do this. There's a second way you can do that too. So you can do it on, a, on an inhale or on an exhale. So I take the same movement, but rather than filling with air, I'd exhale. So not exhale everything, but exhale kind of two thirds, 60, 70% of your air and then do the same thing. And that, the, 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 they both in a way work the same thing, but that one relaxes you much quicker. So like if you've had a lot of stress or you've had a really stressful day, just to do that before you go to bed really takes all that stress out of you and it kind of allows for a, a good night's sleep. Um, so, and with that breath hold then, say for down regulation before sleep, you're taking a normal breath in and then you're breathing out three quarters of the way. It's not quite down to functional residual capacity. It's not, it's not quite a normal exhalation. It's a partial yeah. exhalation. And then you hold your breath. You, yeah, you, you, could, you could say it's a, a, like a normal, ex, you can do it as a normal exhalation. Okay. And that, that's fine. Um, and, then, and then, yeah. So the first one is for energizing. So maybe at the start of the day or you know and the second one is is for relaxing de-stressing kind of at the end of the day you could think of it like that but yeah um i mean it's not exact but like a normal out breath is, is a pretty good place to start mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and you know i suppose warriors we've always kind of put together warriors of the eastern world with being more introvert with a connection with meditation with a tremendous focus of the mind with an ability to have concentrated attention. Yeah. But warriors very often nowadays in the Western world, they're the absolute opposite. They're the ones that get the most attention are the yeah. loud mouths, the big mouths, and the ones that are putting all of their energy outside. And yeah. maybe it's time for warriors, mm. present day warriors, to start bringing their attention inwards do you, do you see a trend or a shift happening? I'm assuming that you're working with people that are maybe mixed martial arts or different disciplines. And um, yeah. the macho male, is the macho male kind of realizing that there's absolutely something in the breath that's so tangible and it will give them the edge because many macho males don't want to know anything about breathing. Mm. And the one that's doing it is going to have that gain. Absolutely. And especially where it starts to matter, you know, when, when they're starting to get tired, um, you know, the, the, well, right the way through really, but especially it's on the edges where, where those gains make such a big difference, you know, being composed and ready. And then, you know, when the tank's running low and running empty, um, or there's a, a psychological fear involved and, a little bit, I'd, I'd kind of call a difference between fighters and warriors. Um, so, and, and of course, see, because a bit like we said with a soldier, you know, a, a soldier or a warrior doesn't really want to be noticed. Because um, if they're noticed, they attract attention and, you know, attracting attention gets you killed pretty quick on a battlefield. Whereas a fighter, 
wants attention either for ticket sales or you know to make it a spec because lots of fighting these days is, is a spectator event so it, it yes. needs to be dramatic it needs to be kind of seen visible you know who wants to go and pay for something that's over in two seconds or you know that, that's yes. not really a spectacle so yes. it's slightly different that the kind of the fighter versus warrior mentality and so society has really he, changed it society has yeah. changed that front that so the guy who's not creating the the the, the scene is not going to get the attention. He doesn't become popular. Yeah, like you know, look at Conor McGregor, who's uh, you know amazed Muhammad Ali, who are both amazing fighters and amazing at gathering that interest that that worldwide. You know, everyone wants mm. to look at them yes, and see yes. them, and, and that's great, and that serves a real purpose for them. But for a warrior, it, it wouldn't really serve a purpose to to be noticed in that way. So, could you be both? Could you yeah, be an introvert? So. And be an extrovert as well when it's needed. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think so. And, and um, well, yeah, I would say, I would say you could. Um, I, I think Muhammad Ali was quite a good example. I think he was kind of deep thinking, um, you know, and, and, and very worldly and introspective, but also able to put on a show when he needed to mm. and, and kind of understood the benefits of that. Um, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He was a philosopher to some degrees. He's he's got some sure. some got great some some great statements that he has made throughout his career. You know, yeah. um, showing a lot of depth there. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, for sure. I think I think you can. Yeah. So coming back to Sistema. So for example, when we're working with somebody's breathing, we always feel that it's very beneficial to. Um, consider breathing during wakefulness, during sleep, for example, we tape up the mouths during physical exercise, etc. Is system is something that is looking at everyday breathing patterns, or is it looking at specific situations that you can apply? Is it looking at the big is it looking at the bigger picture or is it looking at specific, honing in on specific situations? Um both. But the the, the thing that I really like about a systema is that you can train all the time. Um, so, and you can improve your skill all the time. So like, excuse me, just one second. Let me just, okay. My daughter keeps asking me to approve some, something on there. <laughs> Sorry about that, Patrick. You're fine. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, so the, the way you sit, the way you stand, the way you walk, the way you interact with other people, um, are noticing the stress in your body and being able to release it are all opportunities to practice breathing a little bit better. And so, you know, if you know, like for lots of, for lots of people these days, you know, practicing a martial art is, is quite a, you, they may do it out of interest or they may want to be professionals in it, um, or they may do it for, for health and fitness, but if you're doing it purely to be able to defend yourself, it's quite unlikely for most people, unless you're someone that goes looking for it, that you're going to be in a fight in your adult life. Thankfully, we live in that world now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if you can use it as a way to make yourself healthier moment by moment, then, um, that, then I, I think there's a lot, more to, a lot more benefit, a lot more to gain from it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I began doing Sistema because I loved the martial arts side of it, and, and I still do. I'm fascinated by it. But more so really you could just as easily say i'm teaching breathing um mm, mm. You know, in, it's in almost the, as if it's a meditation during action and think i'll just give you a little bit of background with regards oxygen advantage so going back to when i was giving the courses back in 2010 about 95 percent of them were attended by young females typically between the ages of 20 and 40 years of age and i kept on wondering here I'm giving a course on dealing with stress, um, reducing anxiety, panic disorder, etc. Why aren't males attending? Mm. And it was on the back of that then that the idea of the oxygen advantage came, came into being. Because I wanted to do a technique that was very male-dominated sports. And it's yeah. kind of striking me, this is the same with Sistema, because... If you're consciously yeah. and constantly taking your attention out of your mind and bringing it into the body, 
and holding your attention there, you're helping to, to bring a stillness or a gap between thoughts. And this is helping to reduce the repetitive nature of thinking. And as your repetitive nature of thinking is reducing, our ability to hold our attention is improving. And this will be conducive to better stress handling ability. So if you go about your daily life, is it part of it that with Systema, that you are sitting down, you bring your attention out of the mind into the body, you go for a walk, you do the same, you do physical exercise, you do the same. And what would you do if you were confronted with an argument? Would you do the same? So, yeah, there's a, a couple of good things in there. Um, so if the argument, for example, if I was fortunate enough that I could see it from the outside and I had to move into it, I would check myself beforehand. Yes. So see where my level was and bring it down to an optimal state. That may not be completely relaxed because that may not be appropriate. Mm. But, uh, but uh, you know, well, I certainly wouldn't want to be, you know, right up there either. Yes. So I'd bring myself to a level and then, you know, just before you go in, kind of exhale so that so that you you kind of give off a calm um, mm. if you want to do, if of course you want to diffuse the situation um and then during it too you know if you can feel yourself being brought up mm. taken up um gentle movements uh, can be calming too so like for, for people in a in a stressful situation like an argument or a confrontation mm -hmm. they, they start to get very tense you know they're they're, they're breathing will get quite short and shallow, often mm -hmm. mouth, you know, mm -hmm. and but also that, that'll be accompanied with an increasing tension in the body. And when lots of people report that they they say, I couldn't move, I couldn't run, I couldn't do anything, you know, I've done martial Which arts freeze. for 20 years and I couldn't use any of it. It's because they've frozen, that fr freezing is, is a lot yeah. to do with tension. You know, if you tense up your whole body, it's hard to even move. Yes. So just some, some light movement can be calming, you know, if you're trying to talk to someone, but also it allows you to check whether your body is tense or able to act and respond. So I'd accompany that with some, some, some breathing at the same time, kind of light in through the nose, out through the mouth. Um, and then, you know, post whatever the situation developed into, then post situation, then you'd want to work to check how much of the legacy of that event is still in your body, how much stress and tension is still in there. And it, you kind of just, check that you you know your, your posture isn't tight and hunched like a, a fear or an aggression type posture that you kind of straighten up and allow any tension that accumulated from or stress from the situation you allow it to kind of fall out through the body and you allow that through straightening the posture relaxing the muscles and breathing in a way that that facilitates that so really so kind of stressful situations i kind of always try and talk about there's a pre you've got to manage, a during you've got to manage, and a post you've got to manage too. So the kind of three stages of stress and situation. No, it's very good. And do, do this, you um? Sorry, go on. Just coming back to this, so this is something that would be regarded that you're taking your attention into the inner body throughout the day, and then when the stressful event comes, you can automatically and in, in without even thinking about it, it just happens that you're able to take your attention into the body and whereabouts do you take your, I'm just intrigued because mm. again, you know, yeah. do you bring your attention to the area around the chest or do you disperse your attention throughout the body that you're not just a head, but you're in unison that the, the, the mind, the body and the breath is all connected as one. Yeah. It, it's, it's the latter for me anyway, personally, it's kind of a, um, uh, like I say, I, I, I'm in a, a feeling like mm -hmm. through, so correct breathing, correct posture, kind of moving correctly and um, staying relaxed has a feeling associated to it for me now. You know, I, I've practiced it for, and taught it for so long that it's become like a, 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 a feeling of, of calm, ease, mm -hmm. um, pleasure. And then if I... We, I wouldn't quite say grace, but you know, it, it's going that way, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a feeling of at ease. And if I, if I find, and so I notice when I'm pulled out of that mm -hmm. in the body, 
uh, like if a person or a situation is pulling me out of it or myself, my posture is, is causing me to come into that feeling, it becomes, it, it's not a thought, it's a feeling. So, and, and I think we, we work off feelings much better than thoughts, you know, especially under high stress. You know, thoughts are very difficult under high stress, but feelings you can have. And, and you know, like the, the, that's how the body works, doesn't it? You know, it, it kind of, if things are going badly wrong and we're not doing anything to fix it, then either pain comes or grief or mm -hmm. anger or sadness or whatever. So I, I think emotion, we communicate uh, to ourselves with emotions sometimes. And so if I notice myself getting pulled out of that feeling, I'll just restore that. And often just the consciousness of it you can just drop with a breath, you can drop back into it. Um, or maybe you've got to do a little bit of work depending on what the situation was that caused it. But yeah, it's like a full body feeling for me. It's mm. kind of, and we talk similar with the breath that the breath shouldn't just go into your lungs, but you should feel it penetrate your whole body. Um, so to breathe in a way that, you, you know, you feel, it sounds a bit strange and I know because you, you, you obviously, you can't, you breathe into it. Well, the first breath goes into the lungs and then, second and third breaths go throughout the whole body but but to try and breathe in a way sometimes you do an exercise where we'll kind of breathe just and you just feel like you fill the nose and then exhale and then feel like the breath covers the brain and then back out then down to the neck down to the chest and you kind of go all the way down through the body and that way is a great way to find and remove any tension that's sitting in the body so you're scanning the body yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. No, it makes, it makes total sense. If we consider Western society, the vast majority of people are absolutely living in their head and trained to live in their head. And yeah. education teaches us, you know, we're, we're trained how to think. We're, we're trained how to be able to break information into tiny pieces. And I remember when I came out of university, well, even when I was in secondary school and university, I was constantly living in my head. And yeah. the problem with living in our heads is that we're more anxious and we cannot concentrate because we have so many distracting thoughts and mm. the breath, this is one of the major advantages of the breath is that you have a constant companion there that you can connect with. And at the start, yeah, a little bit can be a little bit frustration. You, you bring your attention onto your breathing, the breath wanders off, but in time and it's not, I, I fully understand what you say about taking your attention out of the mind and dispersing it completely throughout the body, completely emerging, merging with the body that we're not just ahead. And I think it's something that we all should be taught to do when we are in school, because we, if we look at the future of mental health issues, if yeah. the future is not promising, if we continue along this, um, this trend in terms of social media, youngsters looking into phones all the time, stuck watching computer games, playing computer games, that it's almost that their mind is trained to be distracted. And one way to help to bring the calmness and the stillness to the mind is to take the attention out of the mind. And um, yeah, it's great. It's really good. So, um, with that, uh, Patrick, I, I, do you know, um, you've heard of Sir Ken Robinson? You know, his thing, his love. Yes, yes. I know he's got a couple of TED Talks about education. Yeah, yes. I think, I believe he passed away recently. Okay. Um, yeah. But um, he, he had a lovely phrase where he said, uh, for lots of people, the body's just a transportation system for the head. And, uh, yes. and especially professors, you know, and it's so spot on. And yeah. do you have any, in particular, do you have any exercises to kind of... Um, help people to, oh, I'm sure you do, to help people to kind of um, get out of the head and, and into the body or to, to lengthen the time of focusing on the breath? Yeah, typically, I think the breath is a, a great place to start. You know, the three yeah. ways to bring our attention into the present moment. One would be to connect our five senses to what's going on around us, mm. our sight, yeah. our taste, our smell, feeling, etc. Yeah. I think that can be frustrating, more difficult to do for people. Mm. The breath is a good place to start. And even just, you spoke about just having the attention just inside the nostrils. Yeah. If we focus on a very small part of the body, it's a lot easier to have our, our attention there. 
Mm. But if we, for example, were told, I want you now to feel the airflow coming in and out of the body, there's too much, too great an area there for people to hone in on. Yeah. So if they're, for example, doing a scanning of the body, oftentimes I would ask people is just place your hand out in front of you, close your eyes. And can you feel, can you bring your attention into your hand? Can you feel the, the temperature of the air around your hand? Can you feel the, the sensations of your hand? Can you bring your attention in there? And then when people have their attention inside their hand, we bring it then as far as their elbow. Can you feel that the, the, the clothes on, on your elbow? Can you feel the temperature? Um, can you feel the contact, the touch of the clothes against your elbow? And then we bring it as far as the arm. And then Brilliant. I might start at the other hand. So I typically always will start off at one place of the body. And I haven't done this in a long time, to be honest, which because these were the courses that I was doing 10 years ago. And now for sports, we kind of get people when they're doing physical movement is that they walk with their attention that, you know, don't just live stuck in your head. You're continuously taking your attention out of the mind into the body. And we get them to do pretty strong breath hold exercises with the oxygen advantage in terms of sports performance. And the reason being is if you hold your breath after an exhalation, as you hold your breath, carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood and it helps improve blood flow to the brain. So it can bring a sense of calmness to the mind, even though, because of course with increased blood flow and oxygen delivery as a result of the breath holding, like, Maybe people might think that if you hold your breath, you're going to deprive your brain of oxygen, but that's not the case. And it's not the case once you don't hyperventilate beforehand. So you're having a normal breath in a normal breath out, you hold your nose. And it's during that breath hold as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the carotid arteries, which are supplying the brain with, with blood flow, they dilate. And you also got what's called a bore effect. So for example, that hemoglobin, which is the main carrier of oxygen in the blood, it releases oxygen more readily. And this can have a calming effect because I often think that the people who need meditation the most find it most difficult to do. Mm -hmm. People with anxiety, people with depression. So we really need to give them a different strategy. We need to give them different exercises because let's face it, if the mind is all over the place, the last thing you want to do is connect on the breath. And this is where the breath holding that you are doing is helpful. Mm -hmm. And this is where the breath holding that we are doing is helpful because with breath holding, we are able to bring in a sense of calmness and, you know, even tactical breathing, what the military have been using. There is a reason that they have used box breathing for so many years. Yeah. Because it can help to bring a sense of calmness and alertness at the same time to improve flow of state. Yeah. So yeah, it's like the one thing about breathing is that the more, the more we teach it and work with it, the more we realize the application and the more we realize what we don't know. And even after like 18, 20 years, I sometimes feel that we've only, I've only scratched the surface of it. Yeah. It's so deep and this is why it's such a pity that alpha males typically don't want to know anything about it, that they don't quite understand the power of the breath. And it's not just about taking that full breath or big breath, but it's about tapping into something else. And it's the, and it's the, um, and it's not shiny and sexy, is it breathing? It's something we do all day, every day. But, and I think, you know, I sometimes wonder, why isn't it taught? Where did it get lost? You know, and, and I know some people do it for improved sports performance. They'll get a little bit of basic breathing training. Um, and some people do it to, you know, for, for mind enhancing. Um, but just taken into every day has such a dramatic effect. And, you know, I, I think in some ways, maybe it was never taught. It was passed on. Like, you know, if you imagine a warrior taking his son out, and when he has to move lightly through a forest, he'll breathe in a certain way and the son would copy it and pick it up, you know, or the daughter or whatever. Mm -hmm. If he, you know, had to kind of recover, he would breathe in a certain way. You know, he would be breathing in through the nose at certain times, you know, um, you know, to, to affect certain states. And I think those things wouldn't have been taught. They would have just been passed on. And as we've got further from nature and further from those natural uses to, you know, then the, the requirement for them 
to be used as has passed too. You know, the the fact of I, I used to be in the army. I was a, a captain in the parachute regiment, and I did um, a stint in the jungle. And I still take people on jungle expeditions now. And um, I can remember vividly. I'd been in the jungle about six month, uh, six weeks, and I can remember sitting on my um, bed in the jungle, basha, like a, a a little platform and cleaning my rifle or something. And I can remember going, and I could smell clean people. And that, you know, I was about 600 meters away up a hill in the jungle. Couldn't see them, couldn't hear them, but I could smell a change. And, you know, the, the nose used to be our primary organ, mm. you know, our primary sense. Um, and, and it doesn't take long at all for it to come back. And I can remember thinking, Wow, it was like the Arbisto kid, you know, I kind of just followed my nose for the smell and you realize uh, how important it was and how much it would have been used. Um, and, and it's still there just hovering under the surface of, of all the benefits you get from it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I totally uh, agree with you. Um, I think it would have been an innate survival to use our nose and even during hunting, you know, running with the mouth closed during sleep. Mm. You know, if you if you look at most animals, they will sleep with their mouth closed, breathing in and out through the nose, especially if, you know, if there's predators that the animals are able to pick up and if prey is, is close by. Um, Absolutely. I find, you know, I, to answer that question, I have no idea why breathing is being overlooked. I switched from mouth to nose breathing back in 1998 and it completely changed my life. And mm. I was a chronic mouth breather for all those years with asthma, with sleep apnea, with, with um, very racing mind, etc. And I was lucky I came across this when I was in my 20s. 25 to 50% of studied children persistently malbreed. And very few people is telling them any different. Now, yeah. it's changed a little bit. There has been a book called Brett that was written by a journalist from the United States called James Nestor. And uh, his Brett is I saw this podcast book, with him. Yeah, is, the, is really podcast. doing well. It's it's came. Mm -hmm. It was number one in Amazon.co.uk. So wow. just watch this space in terms of breathing. I think yeah. that I it would it is now the first time that I would ever say that Brie Brett has a huge future, mm -hmm. and you know it's going to lift all boats. I think really that now that you know sleep was hot about five years ago. You know, people understand about recovery. And if we look and break down the breath even more in terms of when I'm looking at breathing, we're looking at it from a biochemical point of view, a biomechanical point of view, and also a co coherent point of view in terms of heart rate variability and influencing it. Mm. And heart rate variability is a clinical measure of stress and resilience in the individual. And the research, there's sufficient research now looking at heart rate variability biofeedback but the key is, how do you improve it? You improve it by changing your breathing patterns. Because many people are suffering from stress. And if they go to their doctor, and if they say to the doctor, doctor, I'm stressed out, doctor has no real way of measuring if that individual is stressed. How can they measure it? But they could measure it using heart rate variability. So there is something here that we are going to see more and more that there's some benefits from the technology and especially, you know, the gear that people are wearing now, they might yeah. be wearing leaf or Apple watch, or they're going to be wearing these devices. They're wearing the aura ring and these devices are giving feedback of the balance between the stress response and the power, the stress response and the, the relaxation response, the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. And I mm. think that's going to be a driving force as well, because, People now for the first time are really starting to measure where they are at in terms of resilience and in terms of recovery and in the military. And I don't have experience working with any of the military from the UK, but we do have instructors involved with the US military and they are using all of this technology. You know, they are really in tune. They want to know what's the best way to measure human performance and the technology can provide that feedback but one of the means to improve human performance is through the breath. So I think there's a future there. And I will say it the first time I've only started to notice the last two to three years have been phenomenal. So something yeah. is happening. 
Yeah, it is. And, and I, I think it's, it's such an untapped that, you know, I, I, you must see some things very similar. I get people coming into the classes and one of two things are, are kind of the, one of the first teaching practices you do either you, you do some breathing counting with them, you get them to, to, to lie flat because then everything's level, you know, the, the, the liquids are level and the heart doesn't have to do so much work and the muscles are relaxed. And you gently take their breathing up to kind of six counts in, six counts out, or a triangle breath or square, whichever. And then sometimes, quite rare, but sometimes people start to cry, you know, because, oh, but almost everyone without fail um, says, wow, I don't want to get up. I just feel great. And what they're trying to describe is relaxation because yes. it's such an, un most people are only relaxed when they sleep. Yes. Or when they bring it about through smoking or drinking or, you know, some other yes, way yes, of bringing yes. about relaxation. Yeah. You know, they don't know how to consciously relax themselves. Yeah. The other tool we use is the, the Russian breath ladder. Um, do, you know, do you know that one? No. So it, it's a really simple one that you can do while you're walking or running. And mm -hmm. you essentially, so you link your breathing to your steps. So you inhale one step, exhale one step, then inhale, to, and you can, you can do that for a little bit, just, and that, that's good for understanding sufficiency that you don't need to over breathe, just, just one step inhale, one step exhale, should be absolutely fine for most walking cases. And then you can do two steps inhale, two steps exhale, three, four, five, six, six is a good average, and you can go up as far as you like, but 10 is a, a good medium I like to get people to if they can inhale over 10 steps and exhale over 10 steps and and then you can come back down nine eight seven six so that's going up the ladder and coming down the ladder and it teaches them kind of a breath control a smoothness of the breath um, to not be too greedy in their breath or, or too hungry for their breath and um, but also what you're actually doing there as well is as they're breathing in you're lengthening the time they're not thinking so when you're yes. breathing in, it's hard to think at the same time. So you're expanding that gap of no thoughts. And then yes. as you exhale, they, you kind of show them how to relax the muscles and the body as they exhale. So at the end of a 10 step, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and back down, people say, wow, I feel great. You know, and all they've done is walk and breathe. And it's something you can do anywhere, um, the, you know, as you're walking yeah. along the street or... Um, and, and on a run, there's more to it um, because typically we walk about two steps a second. So mm. if you're doing 10 paces to one breath in and 10 paces to one breath out, it means that you are, you're, for example, so 10 paces. So you're breathing in for five seconds yeah. and you're breathing out for five seconds. But breathing out in for five seconds and breathing out for five seconds equates to six breaths per minute. And mm. six breaths per minute is a tremendous rate to get a balance between the parasympathetic and autumn, on the, the parasympathetic right. and, and sympathetic nervous system. And right. the other aspect of it is as well is that it's very efficient in terms of alveolar space. That because if we slow down the respiratory rate, we are not wasting so much air in dead space in the nasal cavity and the throat. Mm in the trachea and mm. the bronchi and the bronchioles. So to break that, that's, that's great. I haven't come across that exercise before, but when we break it down a little bit, it's a very nice exercise. Ah, great. Yeah. 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 And then of course you can do that with your box breath or the, mm. the triangle breath. So you can inhale one step, hold one step, exhale one step, hold one step, inhale over two steps, hold over two, exhale over two. And yeah. if you can do that over 10, if you can inhale for 10 steps, hold for 10 steps, exhale for 10 steps, hold for 10 steps. Yep, and that's, uh, yep, yep. that's, you're really starting to get a good control of your breathing and your psyche too, um, that way, so, yeah. And the point that you made that when you're counting the breath and you're also paying attention to your steps, yeah. that it does take you out of your mind. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, it gives you kind of space from those thoughts, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been amazing, our chat and, I know it's been very brief and that we could continue talking for quite some time. Yeah. Um, how would people hear of you, Matt? 
Uh, so my website is www.matthill.co.uk, uh, or if they do Matt Hill Systema, um, that they'll find it online. Um, I've also got a couple, some books um, uh, on uh, Systema Health, uh, Living Systema, and um, uh, Systema Combat. So I've also got a, on the website, there's a, a free uh, hour long guided breathing tutorial, which talks about those breath ladders and, and other variations that people can um, download and, and have on their phone and, and try it out. So try out some different breathing tools and techniques. So, um, so yeah, there, there's some, some different Great. options. Great. Well, it was lovely talking to you. And, um, you know, even just discussing two Russian techniques, one is a lot yeah. older than Buteyko, which originated back in the 1950s. But there's always going to be some similarities. There's going to be some differences. And generally, it's meeting the two of them together. So lovely conversation. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Matt.